So this is probably what you're expecting instead of the uh, previous slides. <laughs> well, I have my regular audience. They know what to expect. They know to expect there's always going to be a, a travelogue to start my, my talk out. I'm Frank Rowand. I have a couple of roles that relate to this talk. Um, I work for Sony, and one of those roles is I teach people inside of Sony how to work in open source, including how to work with the kernel. And some of the things I was teaching in that class are what motivated me to give this talk. I was trying to explain to them how do you ferret out warnings when you modify source code. And I'm also a kernel maintainer. And in that role, I face the same problem. And I have my own set of scripts historically to deal with that issue. But when I started this talk, I realized I could do much better. And I came up with a much better set of scripts, which we'll see late in the talk. So you probably are all familiar with static analysis tools. This goes to the title of the talk. Just some examples of them are GCC, DTC, Smatch, Sparse, and we have Julia here. And she has her tool, which I can never say the name of correctly. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of different static tools that will show you possible problems or, or typically warnings like from GCC. So what is the problem that led to this talk? And I have a premise to talk about the problem. Three parts to the premise. First, there are, very, there are many warnings reported by the existing static analysis tools against the code that's already in the kernel. The second premise is it can be difficult to determine when you get new warnings when you add a, a change to the code, because there are so many warnings already in the code. The third premise is, because of that, there are many developers and maintainers who don't even bother to check to see if there are new warnings when they get a new submission of code. So let's break that apart and see, is this true or is this false? And I'll, I'll look for your opinion also to see what you think. So here's a simple example. Um, the, look at the bolded code. That's really the part that matters. All the other stuff are steps that I just have to go through to do this sort of a check when I'm doing it by hand. First of all, I check out some version of the code that I'm going to modify. And then you see the bottom of that block of instructions, I do a make with w equals 3. So w equals 1, 2, or 3 invokes a different set of checks for different types of warnings. And I'm doing this make against a single object file. And I'm redirecting the output of this into just a normal file. So now I have a file full of warnings. Then the second block, I've checked out a new version of the code. You'll, you'll see there's one commit made there. I've modified one file. And again, I go through these black magic steps, and I do the make w equals 3. And I put the warnings into a new file called new warnings. So I have old warnings with the original warnings, file new warnings with a new set of warnings. So here's my first premise. Are there many warnings pre-existing? And taking a simplistic look at this, we just simply do a word count of the number of lines in those two files. 1,318 <laughs> lines of warnings in the old, 1,320 after I made my modification. So let me start claiming my first premise, yes, there are many warnings in existing code. It varies by file, but this was just a random file I just picked. Second premise, is it hard to find these new warnings when they occur? So I showed you how many lines there were in each of these warning files. Now if I just diff those two files, and again look at how many lines there are, this is a nice, simplistic approach. You should be able to just stiff them, right? But no, I have 127 lines of difference. The na naive way of looking at this, the very first thing I was saying, I have two new lines of warnings. So why do I have 127 lines in my diff? And, and we'll see that. <laughs> and here's that diff. Um, sorry, can anyone in the back read that? <laughs> this is page one of the diff and page two of the diff. So you can get a sense of what you're facing if you're trying to find where the heck is my two new lines of warning. So I'm going to claim that, yes, it's hard to find new warnings with existing infrastructure. OK, and here, just for reference, this is that one change I made. I simply added one empty function with one argument and exported it. And that's what led to the new warning or warnings, whatever it is. And we'll come back to this later. Third premise, do people actually check for warnings given this, this existing 
Okay, so we have a few people. Let me start with <laughs> narrowing this down a little bit. So when you just build the kernel, the default is w equals zero. So I'd expect all of you would check for new warnings for w equals zero. So the question then becomes for w equals one, two, and three, do you check? And we had a handful of hands, like five hands that went up that so said that you do check for warnings. Uh, do you always check for warnings? Do you sometimes check for warnings? How consistent, kind of iffy? I always build a thousand rand config. Arnd builds a thousand rand configs. We're gonna have some. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that, that I thought about when I started approaching this problem for myself was there must be a tool out there, and, and I'll come back, because we have actually someone told me about a tool yesterday. And you, you occasionally you see reports on the mail list your submission led to a new warning. But I, I wasn't able to ferret out what these tools are and how they work. And so my premise was they're probably talking about W equals zero. Hopefully there is someone out there who's automated this and is checking one, two, and three as well. But I didn't find those, so I, I wrote my own. Now, I'm making this claim that it's really difficult. How about maybe I'm wrong? Um, so. Actually, did I? No, I didn't ask. Um, so how many of you think that my three premises are true? Kind of true? Sad but true. Sad but true. <laughs> <laughs> how many people think that it's not a problem, it's easy, you don't have any issues with it? OK, no hands. OK. Um, so here's a counterexample saying maybe I'm wrong. Um, here's another commit, an entirely different source change, adds a single warning, and here I, I do the checkout, and here's my git log showing I have a single patch, and I do a, a nice simple make with w equals one, and my output is nice and simple. There's my warning, it's obvious, it just jumps right out, no problem. So sometimes it's easy, it's no big deal. And I have reformatted that warning message, so it's nice and pretty and easy to see. If we look at the actual raw, oh, let me step back. Um, so there are a lot of subsystems. If you say W equals one, they will build cleanly, and that's really, really good. A lot of subsystems, it's not till you get to W equals two or three that you'll start seeing a lot of warnings. But then there are subsystems where even with W equals one, you will get plenty of warnings. Okay, so like I said, it's really easy to see that warning. This is not reformatted. This is what it actually looks like. It wraps around. So it's not quite as pretty, but still no big deal. Real easy to read, real easy to see. And I don't build in the source tree. I build in an external directory. So the world looks different in, in my world. Instead of just having warning messages have file names starting at the root of the kernel directory or the kernel tree, mine start at slash and show the full path up to my git tree and then the path within the git tree. So my paths on my files are much longer, as you can see in this example. And just comparing those two examples, there's the warning message originally if you're building in tree versus building out of tree. So it's a little bit uglier, it's a little bit more noise, it's a little bit harder to find mess error messages and interpret them, especially if you have a lot of them. Okay. So am I whining? <laughs> you know, if I'm complaining about something as trivial as that, am I smart enough to be a kernel developer? You know, can I even tie shoes? Look, I, I, I do have lace-up shoes. I do tie my shoes. You just did a code, uh, code of conduct violation on yourself. Oh, <laughs> Tim claims I did a code of conduct violation on myself. I'll, do you want to report me or should I? <laughs> <laughs> So what, what, what are the implications of this? It really turns out that there are many, many sources of these little bits of noise. And each and every one on its own may not be a big issue, but when they add up, it starts to become really, really hard sometimes to find your new warnings. So I was trying to get rid of lots of different types of noise. So we have some examples, different types of noise. Um, if you do a, a make even quiet, Make is going, to start, is going to tell you what it's doing. It's going to tell you um, what scripts it's calling. It's going to tell you what files it's uh, compiling, things like that. It's going to tell you when it's leaving directories. 
So I like to get rid of all that noise. That's useless to me. I don't need that. <laughs> so with a simple pipeline, I can do a grep and get rid of that. Make dash S. Make dash S. I was looking for that. You would think there would be a silent. Okay, so, so Arn tells us to make dash S. I'll have to make, do it the easy way then. Um, <laughs> the way that I did it here was simply redirecting standard out. Or sta yeah, so it goes away, and I'm only getting standard error, which is where the warnings are. And then I pipe it through sed to remove that long prefix on my path. So that sed is substituting get curder into blank. Get curder is a script that I wrote. And just a real quick digression, why don't you just use PWD? It works for most people. I have a corner case. There's always a corner case. And I get to my um, kernel tree through a soft link. And PWD gives a different result when you get in through a soft link. And it doesn't match what make says. So I, I wrote get curder to report what make thinks the path is. <laughs> Trivial, but you know, it's all these little details that add up into making this a, a more difficult task for the average person who really doesn't want to spend time on fixing these things. Another gotcha is if you do make with w equals one, and then you do make w equals two of the same exact file, there's extra work that goes on. And so you have to do make w equals one, do whatever you want to do, make w is equals two, throw that away, do make w equals two again. And here's an example. So I did the make w equals one, and you can see that there's a lot of CCs going on, a lot of compiling host CC, host LD, the linkers going on. There's a, even a CC, a whole bunch of stuff going on there. The second time I do make w equals one, all that stuff disappears. So, pardon? Dependencies. I, I didn't look into why those dependencies exist. So make w equals two will change the compiler flags and the kernel remembers how you compiled every single file that you have compiled before with what flags. And if the flags are different from the last time, it will compile it again. Yeah. And in this example, these other compiles had no warnings. I do have cases that I've encountered where these other incidental compiles generate warnings also. So you don't want to mix those into your warnings output file and think, here's a new warning because of the change I made. It's not. It's a pre-existing warning. Uh, another issue is uh, I'm sure you're used to GCC warnings. The line number's in there. If a line number of where a warning is changes, here's an example where it moved by three lines, the, the warning message is different as far as diff is concerned, simply because the line number has changed. So it's easy enough to filter that out. You can use said, there, there are a lot of tools to, to get rid of those line numbers. But it's just annoying. And if you do remove the line numbers and look at the result with no line numbers, and then try and go and find out where, what, what line number is that warning on, that line number is now gone. <laughs> you have to go back to the original warning diff that had the line numbers. It's just a real pain, real annoying. Uh, another source of noise. This is kind of a misnomer when I say it's a macro expansion. This is really an error check within something that a macro calls. But for shorthand, this is essentially a macro expansion leads to something that has a line number um, incorporated into it. So it's the, the, the underscore, underscore, score, compile time, assert, underscore, line number. <laughs> so if I have this macro moved from one line to another, the warning message changes that number. This was a surprise to find. It was interesting chasing it down to see quite what was being invoked. So I have my own personal script as maintainer. I teach my class inside of Sony, and I was giving them line-by-line -line examples of how to fix all these things and build pipelines and what commands to use. And I was going to essentially give that as my talk. And then I got into it, and I thought, this is crazy. I really should just fix up the scripts. 
make it easy. <laughs> and none of this do it by hand all the time. So I have a new script called Check Warn and some programs. And here's an example of using it. This is the same commit for my very, very first example, simply adding one new function with one parameter and exporting the function. And here's an example of running the script. I simply check out my original version. I run my script, warn check, and I got carried away here, v verbose. RF2 is how, what filters I was gonna apply. Uh, dash S was <laughs> save my temporary warning file so I can look at them afterwards. And I'm just saying, here's the, the source file that I wanna analyze. So I could have ignored all those other flags and just said drivers OF overlay. And the script will create warning files for the original checked out version. Then it prompts me and says, somehow get to your new version of the file. So you could do a git checkout, you could do a, a quilt push, you could apply a patch by hand, whatever your, your, your workflow is to get to a new version of the, of the file, and then just continue from that point. So in my case, I did a git checkout to get to my newer version. And here's the output from that script. There are gonna be several sections, starting kind of at a rough, get an idea how things changed it's not, this is not a very precise, accurate report at this level. There could be false positives, false negatives. So for W equals zero, the old version had zero warnings, zero lines of warnings in the, in the output, and the new one still has zero. When I went to W equals one, we went from two lines to three lines of output. W equals two, we went from 606 to 609. So there are three more lines of, of warning not necessarily three more warnings, but three more lines of warning message. So this is kind of a rough, but it gives you a good, quick characterization of did things maybe change? How aggressively did they change? Then the next report coming out of this is for each type of warning, how many were there before and how many after? And so far the tool knows about uh, GCC warnings and DTC warnings. I haven't yet added in Smatch and, and Sparse so it categorizes by type of warning, and you can see it highlights uh, W redundant decals incremented by one. So it's a real good way, again, of getting a quick overview, what type of errors happened or warnings, did, did they change? Um, if you added a new warning of one type and removed one of a different type, that would jump out here, whereas that might not jump out in the number of lines in a warning report or number of warnings. So there are definitely false negatives and false positives still available in, in these various outputs. And this is the W equals one, two, and three. So it's showing the whole list of, so for W equals three, that was redundant decals, which I just showed. W equals two, um, one of the warnings they checked for were shadows. And W equals one, it, was, it caught a missing prototype. So it, it's good to check all those W levels. And this, this is a real good example of, of why that applies. Then there's the detail. This is the one that it's much harder to get a false negative. Um, I, I said that when you just do a diff with no line numbers, it's hard to <clears throat> figure out where the problem really is. So the very first chunk, the filter chunk, is the diff with no line numbers. And it, it did pull out there's only one new warning. We see the two new lines. We can see what the warning was. It was that redundant decal. And then I show both the old warnings and the new warnings with the line numbers in them. So now you have the source, the reference to see where to go look in the source. So in the old code, of course, there was no warning in this case. In the new code, we see the three lines of new warnings with the line numbers involved. So it's real easy to go find that new warning out in the source code. So that's really convenient. So where do you find warrant check? Eventually, I want it to end up in the kernel source tree. I hope we get it there. There's been talk recently about creating an area for maintainers tools to live in the kernel source tree. And it's a gray area. Is it a maintainer tool? Is it a submitter tool? Is it both? I think they'll all fit in the same place. And hopefully we do create that location and hopefully something like this will get accepted in there. Right now, I have it on GitHub so you can pull it down and use it for yourself. It is totally useful at this point. It's better than what I've been using myself. <laughs> so I'm happy to have a better tool for myself. 
And as I continue to work on it, I will mirror it on GitHub. So as it gets enhanced, it will, it will continue to live there. Once it's in kernel.org, it'll probably disappear from GitHub eventually. So there's still some things to do. There's still some rough edges. I'm a bash person, so I wrote it in bash. I probably should make it work for just plain old shell, right? <laughs> Otherwise, the kernel people won't like it so much. I love three space tabs, um, <laughs> eight space tabs to get it in the kernel. So, you know, a lot of dumb little things like that, little trivia things. Like I said, I support C files, assembly files, and DTS files. And I'd like to add support for some of the other static tools. I showed you the example of running the command, and I specified a single file name. It's going to be a very simple change to be able to specify a whole list of files and run the report for all of them. And the natural outflow of that is if you have two git commits, you should be able to feed the script one git commit old, one git commit new. And the script should be able to check out the old version, do the checks, check out the new version, do the checks. And it should be able to know what were the files modified between those commits. So it should be able to figure that out itself or let you manually choose which of the files modified you want to look at specifically. And again, I'd like it to go to kernel.org. Um, so what I'm asking for is I found just through stumbling over them, some of these things that lead to difficulty filtering out changes that really aren't changes, but just things like the lines moved. So if you encounter any other types of patterns that the tool doesn't take care of, please let me know, and I'd be glad to filter those out too. And I meant to sidetrack here. Um, so I mentioned that, okay, I can never say your name. I want to use the G, but it's here. <laughs> Whoops, I got to get you so you can see. Just told me yesterday he has a tool that does a lot of the similar things of removing some of that noise, things like line numbers. He does some other things to remove some other noise. And the place that he uses it is he takes reports of entire kernel builds from, from Michael Ellerman, and he runs his tool against those. So it's a slightly different environment. My tool would not work in that very well. My tool is focused <laughs> on a, a single file or a, a small number of files. And his tool is in his git repo, the Linux script on GitHub, GitHub, G-E-G-E-E-R-T-U. -E -E <laughs> um, another thing, on my second slide or first slide, I talked about static tools and gave just a few examples. Mr. Arnd <laughs> gave a talk at ELC 2016 about static tools. And I recommend going and looking at this for a lot more information on some of the static tools but it just was a distraction for today to try and go into any detail of static tools. So at this point, does this seem like a, a good solution? Do you think life will be easier? Will people start being able to check for warnings? Will people be more likely to check for warnings if these tools are in the, the kernel tree? Where's the microphone? I'd give it a spin. <laughs> OK, got one. I, I would be happy to sacrifice, I don't know, what, a 20, 30K of my Git repositories going forward. <laughs> nice. I have some other plans, but I could probably use those tools to help mm -hmm. with those. So some of the other plans I have are reorganizing the warning levels so that a lot more of the things in W equals 1 that have very few warnings get enabled by default and then we fix them all. Yeah. And I also have some ideas for how you can more easily turn on and off a particular warning locally in the code when there's a known warning that we don't have a good solution for, but we want to shut it up. Yeah. And I have ideas for turning on extra warnings per directory or per file. So you don't have to, to pass it on the command line. You just 
annotate the make file saying all of this directory we always want with w equals one for things like drivers media and drivers M MFD, they already test that way, which means there are no false positives. Um, and then they get everybody else to do the same. Yeah. yeah. You'll also find that in different subsystems, there are different practices for the different warning levels. Like I said, some subsystems are really clean at W equals one. And so you can expect that if you in inject a new error at that level, you'll get called out on it. There are other subsystems with so many that maybe no one will notice if you add another one. But, but overall, I think we would like to push the entire kernel toward fewer and fewer warnings. More questions, comments? Question from the way in the back. Uh, have you considered using LLVM for compiling? Yeah, this? so um, there's LLVM is, I always get confused, is Clang and LLVM, are they related or separate and different? Same thing. Same, yeah. okay. Yeah, um, I was hoping that the, the format of the warnings coming out of LLVM will be the same, and that's one of my questions to follow up on and make sure it really is. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then it will just work. So what I'm searching for is the dash W, essentially. There's, there's a little bit more to it. But if, if the same format of warning comes out, it should be really easy. Yeah, so I don't know the answer to that question. But yeah. a few years ago, I looked at uh, like the error messages produced by GCC and the error messages produced by LLVM. And it seemed like LLVM was more intelligent, but intelligent about removing un irrelevant things. Ah. GCC was tend to get confused and then spew out a lot of messages that didn't mean anything. Yeah. So you might get more precise or at least different information from LLVM. Yeah, that'd be good to get rid of some of the false negative or false positives. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, if there are other static tools that people are interested in, I'd love to hear about them. So GCC, I don't know which version it was, but they just uh, redid a bunch of their error message formats. So they tried to make them more user friendly, I think because of competition from Clang, because Clang had better error messages. That was the general consensus. Right. So you may have to adapt right. to that. So, so the only part of the format that matters to this tool is the dash W some string, because okay. it reports that table of how many were there before, how many are there after. But if you look in the diff, you'll see the full string of the warning message. So as long as just dash w some string, I'm good. OK, so I've got a couple of questions. Firstly, um, do maintainers actually take warning fixes seriously? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, please. Do maintainers take warning fixes seriously? Uh, some of them seem to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've unfortunately been forced to do pre-sales work, so I've been trying to do something useful by hunting sparse warnings in the kernel. I'm up to 147 patches now. Yeah. Um, and uh, what do you feel about people adding more warnings? <laughs> uh, good. I, I, mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, if yeah. it's a warning that's showing a, a real potential code problem, yeah. then, then to me that's a good warning. Yeah. If it's I mean, just a preference warning, like, um, well, I'll use the check pack, patch example, you know, 80 line limit, Th then sometimes that's a nuisance warning. Sometimes it actually is a very valuable warning because sometimes when I've hit it, it makes me stop and think, is my code structured well? Do I have horrendously long variable names, which are more difficult to read and understand and scan through? And so actually that 80 column warning has sometimes helped me clean up my code. Sometimes it's just a lot easier to have clean code when it's long lines. So again, it's the type of warning, if it's useful, yes, more warnings are good. If it's... Yeah. I mean, just to go back to my little example, of those 147 patches, there are actual four bugs found yeah. in that where people have either passed the wrong argument or have missed some sort of user space annotation or in one case, missed a, um, a uh, engine cast. Yeah, and I actually I saw those messages in the mail list, and I was really happy to see real, real bugs being catch, caught. 
And in my own examples in Device Tree, when I started running these different levels of W equals, I have caught real bugs also, just with the existing warnings. So it, it definitely is valuable when I can look at the ones that are real versus, versus not. Um, and my last comment is, one of the things I have been recently doing, which is why I'm running sparse a lot, is I'm currently teaching sparse how to deal with printf formatting strings, which apparently is a lot of fun, and <laughs> they are incredibly difficult things to deal with. So hopefully that will get merged at some point. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm glad you've been working on this stuff. Yeah. Originally, in my early years, I wasn't using Smatch and Sparse. You know, there are so many levels of things to do as you become more involved as a maintainer or a submitter. And once I started using those tools, I really became hooked on them. And, and they become part of my automated process. It just makes it a whole lot easier when you automate things. Question over or comment? Uh, hi. Uh, I'm not sure it's related, but uh, I have observed that uh, some warnings are, are specific to configuration. It means that for the same code base, you change the .config yes. file, and then some warnings pop up. Yes. Uh, so how is it related to, to your work, basically? Yeah, this tool d can't deal with that at all. It doesn't know. But that is one of the things I teach about in my class. Um, one of the things that the tool does is check whether the .o, the corresponding .o exists. If it doesn't exist, it gives you a warning. It'll try and make it. It checks again. If it still doesn't exist, that's a very good clue that your config is off. You need to change your config. But there are other config types. There's a lot of if a certain config do real stuff, else essentially stub things out because you still want the builds to build and try and detect warnings and errors. And you have to know whether you're checking the real code or stubs and be sure that, in the example of running my tool, you'd actually want to run with both configs, the one with the real code and with the one with the stubs, and make sure that they're both clean. And that becomes a very complex, ugly issue with the combinatorial config options, which may impact your code that, that may not be obvious. There may be more generic config options that aren't specific to your code. OK. And what configuration do you use for your experiments? My experiment, experiment is on a Dragon board, and I'm using the MSM 8970. Um, it's ARM def config. <laughs> MSM? 89.74, yeah. Um, just that def config. And then given that I do device tree, I like to turn on my unit testing. So I tend to turn that on. And I actually had to, in this case, to get the overlay file, because that only comes into play once you start doing dynamic. And I turn on dynamic and unit tests kind of as a whole. So that's a real good example. If I didn't turn it on, I couldn't even check for any warnings in this file that I'd modified. Thank you. So we have two minutes. Question from Julia and question up here. Uh, so just in the interest of endless self-promotion, um, a couple years ago I presented here a tool which is called JMake, where, which lets you, um, it informs you if the configuration you chose doesn't actually compile the lines that you changed. That would be really good to tie into this. I have a last question for people. Is anybody actually checking the warning tools to make sure they are actually producing correct warnings? <laughs> <laughs> Answer from Arnd. Where's my compiler guy? I was talking to him earlier. Did Kim so come I, to the I session? I just spent a year building kernels with Clang. And when I submitted the last patches for, for the current merge window, Linus pointed out that I had introduced a very trivial warning that Clang had apparently never missed and that GCC had always warned about and it was very embarrassing. So yes, a lot of the tools do miss important warnings. Yeah, that's one example of where it's good to have multiple tool chains building the same project. You have 10 seconds. 
I'll be around till tomorrow morning. I'll definitely be at the closing game session if you don't find me anywhere else. And I'll hang around here after the talk. I have no need to rush off right now. Pardon? Oh, I've, in half an hour I have to rush off, but <laughs> until then, <laughs> I'm available here. Thank you all for coming.